Step back through the ages and behold the ancient city of Babylon. Dates for sale, fresh from the grove. Around 570 years before the Common Era, under the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar II, Babylon was the heart of Mesopotamia. The ramparts stood in straight lines, the Ishtar Gate shone in blue glaze. The markets were crowded, yet amid the blazing sun and the drifting desert winds, there was a quiet longing. Legend tells of Queen Amitis, a noblewoman from the highlands of Media, ancient Iran. She grew up among cool green hills where cypress trees traced the ridgelines and mountain springs ran cold from their source. In Babylon, she found a capital of brick and brilliance, yet also of heat, wind, and desert air. The plain was magnificent, but it was not home. She longed for the smell of damp earth after rain, the shade of tall trees, and the gentle green that soothed the eye. The king saw this. He did not build a small courtyard. He chose to raise an artificial mountain, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. At once, it eased the queen's longing and displayed the engineering and organization of the empire. The construction site stretched along the riverbank, alive with dust and noise. Surveyors pulled taut cords to set the lines while workers molded mud bricks, dried them in the sun, fired them hard in kilns, and hauled them by cart to the rising foundations. Vault after vault was built in succession, locking together like a honeycomb to spread the massive load of soil, trees, and flowing water. The clang now. of hammers and shouted orders mixed with the distant roar of the Euphrates. Upon this substructure, Deep. engineers laid a sequence of waterproofing layers. First came sticky black bitumen, pressed into every joint. Then sheets of lead, fitted at channels and reservoirs to guard against seepage. Over these they spread pebbles and coarse gravel, providing drainage so water would not crack the masonry. Hold there. Finally, tightly packed reed mats formed a shield to stop roots from burrowing into the vaults. Only then did laborers carry baskets of fertile soil, pouring... Steady tamping and leveling until each vast terrace became a man-made highland, an artificial mountain Lift. prepared for vines, oh. orchards, and groves. Water was the lifeblood of the hanging gardens. From the broad Euphrates River, teams of workers labored at ingenious push, man, lifting push. devices, wheels, chains of buckets, or spiral pumps that drew water steadily upward to the terraces. Ancient sources differ on the exact design, but all agree on the principle. Raise, filter, divide, and distribute. Once lifted, the stream entered stone-lined channels, carefully sealed to prevent leakage. It passed through reed mats that filtered out silt, then flowed smoothly along lead sheath troughs, glinting in the Sunday. From there, it descended in gentle runnels to reach the lower beds. At each junction, clay sluice gates slid by hand, 
directed the flow. Today toward orchards heavy with figs and pomegranates, tomorrow to rows of onions and here. cucumbers. The constant murmur of water beneath the trees, mingling with rustling we leaves, turned the terraces into a living oasis, proof that Babylonian science could bend the river itself to memory and desire. Once the great structure was complete, the Babylonian gardeners began the next task, carrying young trees and cuttings up to the terraces. Tall date palms were planted at central points, their crowns spreading wide to cast shade and soften the Sunday. Along the edges, they set rows of dark green cypress and pine, evoking the high mountains of Media, the homeland of Queen Amitis. In the inner courts, they planted fig trees and pomegranates, offering both sweet fruit and bursts of red color in season. Vines were trained to creep over the rough brick walls, their green curtains spilling downward to veil the heavy masonry. Around channels and basins, they set clusters of myrtle, splashes of blue iris, and tall reeds swaying in the wind. Upon the still pools, lotus blossoms floated, white and pink against the mirror of water. The plantings were arranged in layers of ecology, tall canopy trees above, fruit and shrubs beneath, and ground covers below. This design created a living balance, shade cooling the air, roots binding the soil, flowers drawing birds and insects. The terraces became a self-sustaining oasis, lush and alive. The air itself was transformed. Breezes carried the scent of resin and fruit, mingled with the earthy smell of damp soil. Visitors felt coolness spread across their skin as they walked among rustling leaves, birdsong, and the murmur of water. No longer bare terraces of stone, the structure had become a hanging forest, a green paradise raised by human hands. Daily operation resembled a strict production shift. At dawn, the head gardener walked the route, checking flow, clarity, and pressure. The water engineer carried a clay tablet, listening to the sound of each outlet. Too loud meant excess head, too faint meant a blockage. One team cleaned reed filters and scraped scale from the lead edges. Another patched tiny leaks with bitumen. Another loosened soil and blocked roots when they pressed against the masonry. Another pruned, tied vines and laid mulch to preserve moisture. With the seasons, they rotated crops, spread river silt and compost, and planted new cuttings to keep the garden strong. All records were written in cuneiform, daily wages, rations of barley and oil, payments in silver rings, counts of trees, and weights of lead used. The garden was a living machine, and its records were the pulse that kept it alive. The story may differ across ancient records, but its meaning is clear. Babylon used science to serve memory and love. A king raised a mountain of gardens so that his queen could remember her homeland and at the same time declared to the world, we can master water, earth, and sunlight. When the wind moves through the leaves, when water glides like silk over stone, Babylon answers the desert with green. And within that green, the longing of one woman became the renown of an empire. 